welcome back to my show. Uh, last week, uh, I interviewed Nibal Masood, and the week before that, I get, talked a little bit about myself and how uh, I think about money, commission, commissioning, and, and just like making a career um, as in the creative space, either as composer or other. And so today I invite a friend, colleague who lives here in Michigan, um, Adam Shoemaker. Adam is a composer, is a arts administrator and teacher, does a lot of really cool things. I'm just gonna have him talk briefly about himself uh, and, and frame where he's coming from and, and what, where he's at in his career. Did you know about 80% of the people who watch my videos are not currently subscribed to my channel? Did you also know that about 60% of the people who watch my videos come from some sort of external source like Facebook? So please, if you like my videos, subscribe to my channel. It really helps a lot. If you like the video, like it. It helps with the Facebook algorithm. And finally, if you want to hear something new or if you want to comment on what I something I said, please leave a comment. I try my best to respond to every single comment that I get and whether it's good or bad, and I look forward to hearing from you. you. This community is why I keep doing this, so thank you so much for being a supporter. Thanks, Spencer. Um, I'm Director of Education with the Gilmore Keyboard Festival, and that's my full-time job. Um, I also keep a part-time position at Kalamazoo College. I lovingly call it my eternally or always visiting professor job, um, where I teach a class a quarter there. Um, and then I freelance, compose, and arrange. Um, I used to teach a lot of lessons. I don't do a whole lot of that anymore. Um, and I live in Kalamazoo, and I have three kids. My wife and I both are working from home right now during the pandemic. And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting ride coming from you know two music degrees and trying to figure out well what do I want to do with it all um, and how do I <laughs> how do I make money? Uh, but here I am. Yeah, and you know then. Talking with you uh, while we were setting this up, um, I think that the thing that is really important for people to realize is, is that it's like the things that Adam is doing are very common in our field, having multiple income streams. Um, your primary income might not come from your creative work. It might come from some other job. Um, and if you're lucky, like Adam, you actually get to work, have that full-time job be still in the music space because that's not everybody. Um, and so I guess that's just to, to be a little bit more specific uh, without necessarily using numbers, like how do you make that work as, you know, as a person living, as an adult person with, you know, responsibilities and kids and a, and a family, like how do you make that work? The, the working schedule or the income or what, what do you, what specifically? Uh, all, of, all, of the all of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, as I was thinking about it, the the decision to go into admin was an interest early on so um kind of having that sense of what i'd like to do was really important in discovering what i could do uh, and so volunteering for nonprofits and being part of that presenting world as a master's student really helped me kind of aim for more administrative roles as i cobbled together you know the work early on. I think when I first graduated Western, I was like teaching part-time at Western classes, you know, by the semester. I had a part-time band director job at a, a private school. I was doing auditorium sound. I was teaching private lessons at two places on trumpet and guitar. And it was just, it was wild. Um, but, you know, as I, as I saw the different aspects of what I could do in my town, uh, being able to direct my efforts into areas that were more lucrative or more regular or more stable, I would say, stability being the key, was something that I could do um, in addition to kind of letting go the things that I wanted to do less of. And so for me, it was kind of a mix of taking any opportunity and then once I had enough to be able to direct my opportunities into the, the areas that I wanted to do more work in, to the point where I'm feeling pretty good right now. Um, but then you start to, you know, there's always something. It's like, right, you always want the next gig. That's the problem with the varied lifestyle. But, you know, right now with my stability and feeling good about what I'm doing, um, I can kind of have these side projects like the record label that I started or composing different projects and um, pursuing that long-term 
goal of you know having income through royalties and performances and activity as a creative wonderful and you know i think that having all these different streams um, i'm sure figuring out ways to value your time when you do figure out you know if you do other extra teaching or you do you know when you do creative work i'm sure that can be really challenging um can you talk briefly about how you set those rates and maybe how you even raise them when you decide to? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, the, the rate setting is always an interesting concept and there's a lot of great people talking about it. Um, like Megan Enan and Jennifer Rosenfeld, they're, they're bringing up this money talk a lot. Um, so I highly recommend people kind of delve into it with other professionals too. But you know, the, the biggest thing is for me at least has been to and this has been a personal choice but for me to take a look at the scene that you're in and try and assess like what are the rates that are happening around you and then where do i fit within those rates and then aiming above that because um, we often undervalue ourselves and so it's important to kind of forcefully push yourself beyond that so you can make a decent amount um and yeah, and so for me, it's kind of, you know, seeing the scene, what's, what's available, what's the lowest rate, what's the highest rate around me that I'm observing, and then how can I fit into that market? And is that, and importantly too, is that enough for me? Okay. Um, um, yeah, so when I was early on when lessons were a strong or important part of my um, income, I really had to determine, you know, how many could I teach a week and how many could I think, do I think I could get in terms of students and then figure out, you know, between the rate ranges in town, you know, where could I set myself so that it was worthwhile for me um, to fill my time and also pay my bills at that time, uh, but also be uh, an, a good rate to attract the audience that I wanted or the students that I wanted. Um, and so there's a lot of minute factors that come into play and you can, you know, dabble all day, but you kind of have to take them in for what they are and try to shoot just above where you think you're at. Um, and I always say above, you know, cause I, every time I talk money with somebody, there's people that have strategies for doubling, you know, double your rate and quote the, quote the person that I think that's, that's good. Um, because it helps us elevate into an actual livable income. Um, cause just charging 20 bucks for a lesson isn't always going to cut it. And it, and it also, the other, the other side of that too, is it undervalues the work for us and our colleagues. Um, so yeah, the, the setting those rates for me is a mix of that, seeing the scene and then figuring out what do I need to survive or what do I need to make that worth my time in terms of income. And then also what is it, I, I, I do consider what is it doing for the community? Um, are my rates elevating or are they, you know, cutting into that, what we could earn as uh, musicians and creatives? And I, I will say just something to add to, to that point um, about teaching and, and setting rates for that. Um, I know for some people, they, um, including myself, we, we really do think about, well, if, I, if my rates are this high, there are people who might be really deserving, who are really wonderful, who don't have that access. Um, and I think the, the way to think about it is, you can still charge them what you need to be able to get them in um, and still charge more to the people who can actually afford it. And, and actually, and that's a good point to actually raise your rates. And that way you can support those people who would actually be really wonderful additions to our community, but don't have the access because of cost barriers. Yeah, you can always give a scholarship, you know, and that scholarship comes in the form of a discount. You know, I've seen teachers, um, raise their rates, but then, you know, the students that they want to keep with them that are really dedicated, they go, you know, look, we'll just keep what we did before. You kind of grandfather you in, um, but you don't advertise it, right? Because right. um, you want the new students coming in to, to be at the, the rate that you're asking. So, but yeah, that's a huge thing um, in terms of accessibility is that you can always, I mean, you're in charge, you can always discount. Um. So uh, I'm curious about just working for free, because I know oftentimes as creatives, we do a lot of volunteering, but we also, you know, we, I, I have not written every single piece for money um, in the last five years. I have definitely written pieces that I have been paid for. I've written pieces where I haven't been paid for. How do you navigate that um, in any of the work that you do? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, when it comes down to commissions, it's about the, well, it's not the only thing, but <laughs> when it comes down to commi commissions, uh, I really try to think about where I'm at, you know, what can I handle? And then what do I want to do? And what is it going to result in? Um, you know, personally for me right now, I don't have any paid commissions in the future. Um, my arranging was going well, but then like, you know, the pandemic hit and they're not meeting in person. So like, I'm not doing that either. So it's been kind of stripped out to, to pretty much not anything. Um, but I did pick up a commission and one of that commission, one of those commissions, uh, is not paid, but I agreed to do it on an agreement of performances. Um, and lots of publicity. So, you know, for me, and that that also ties into another aspect of income is like, you know, how can I maximize my ASCAP relationship? Um, can I sell scores? Can I get more people to play and get more performances? Uh, I've done that in the past and it's turned out pretty well. Um, I wrote a piece that uh, was, was not charging for that commission, but it got performed several times um, and was released on a CD and I probably made more money off of it than, um, I would have probably gotten on a commission charge anyway, through those activities. It just takes a little extra work for that. Uh, I will say that when you're first starting out, it can be really daunting to think, okay, I just graduated from college. I need to start charging for my work because that is how am I going to make a living? And I understand it's fear. It's a fear based, you know, I have bills to pay. That is totally understandable, but, and, and here's my, 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 but that I think it's important to remember that, uh, you don't just jump in to any career, right? You have to, and I'm not saying you have to pay your dues. I am saying you have to find ways to find value in your time. Even if that value isn't in upfront, you know, I'm getting paid, right? You could write a piece, it could get, you could write a piece for somebody that gets performed at a conference and then 30 more people are like, Hey, this piece was wonderful. I heard it. I now want to purchase it. You maybe didn't get that upfront, you know, $500 commission, which is what I would gather most people charge for early commissions. Yeah. Um, the, but you do get 20 to 30 people who might want to play your piece. Um, and you're, you're creating relationships, which lead to future commissions. When those 20, 30 people come together in the future and say, hey, I, I played this one piece, really liked it, would love to maybe work with you again in the future. Do you have more work? And then we can talk about, you know, building those relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing that t comes into that, too, is like, you know, do you have a lineup of paid commissions? Then you can say no to the free, the ones that aren't charging, right? That you're not charging for. Um if you don't, do you, have, do you have time to do something for somebody and time to follow through with ASCAP or BMI and claim those performances and sell those scores? Do you have those systems set up? You know, and if you do, you can you can do OK with that, you know, um, and it's that for me, for me personally, it's a slow growth thing because like I'm not super prolific um, and I know I can only handle a little bit at a time right now. But, you know, can I maximize each opportunity that I get? I'm going to try. Yeah. Um, so just to close, I'm curious, uh, what other advice do you have for, for composers or creatives who are, are, you know, entering this field, either just graduating or, or even ones who've been in it a little for a while and are still trying to figure it out? What advice do you have? Yeah, it's the, I mean, there's so much advice, right? <laughs> um, if we're talking rates and money, I think the, the really important thing is to really find a peer group or a mentor or somebody that you can talk shop with, um, actual dollar numbers. And that's that's the big taboo is like, we don't talk about money enough. And this has been something I've been, again, one of my side projects working towards writing for a new music box, uh, the composer performer profiles. And I also have a little survey that's uh, asking people basically, what did you make last year? And can you tell me your income? And just using that data to kind of see like what are creatives doing monetarily, right? Are we making enough? Are we charging enough? Um, but the biggest thing you could do is to, again, talk about it with people. So don't just um, treat your rates as living in a bubble or just yours. Like ask your friends what they charge. 
ask your friends, you know, how much they've made at commissions. Um, even if people you don't know, you know, you could find me on Twitter and message me and ask me some things. You know, I've had commissions that are, you know, I, I don't charge a thing, but then I get some performances. I've had commissions where I've made a lot of money and never seen this music again, you know, <laughs> it's wild. Um, but the, the important thing is being able to have a, a perspective of what is normal, what is possible is also really important. Um, and that comes into play of thinking about like budget size. You know, if a, you know, if a friend uh, approaches you and says, hey, would you write me a piece? And you know your friend and like, if they're gonna pay you, great, but if, if they're gonna perform it a lot, okay, you have some negotiations to do. But if like the CSO approaches you, you can look up their form 990s on the, you know, the GuideStar website and see what kind of budgets they're dealing with. And you can ask what's an appropriate amount. You know, um, I, I do flex my rates that way in terms of um, what is the scope? What is the size of the organization or the project? Um, and what is the possible budget? Right. You can always scale back and negotiate if you shoot too high. Although, you know, there's always a possibility that they'll turn away. But, you know, if, if, that's that's the dare I, dare I say fun of it, <laughs> kind of that negotiation. So, um, yeah. So, again, the advice for me is really just try to get a perspective of what's happening out there financially um, so that when you're making these decisions, you're not making them in a bubble and also consider what you need and making sure that um, what you're asking fulfills what you need to survive. Um, and also mirrors that market a little bit too. Absolutely agree with everything that you said today. Um, thank you so much for, for being involved with this project. Uh, I think, as you've said, it's really important for people to just be aware of what is a, what's possible and what they can do and, and what's even appropriate to ask. Because I know that that's Part of the problem with money is that this culture has been taught that you're not supposed to talk about money it's rude um and unfortunately that helps that causes a lot more pay disparity than people even realize um, i'm sure there are people there are the people who are charging a ton and then there's a, most posers aren't and so we just have to uh all be communicating better so i hope that this is helpful if you yeah, do like, like these you things, said Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hold on. I was gonna, I, I was gonna finish up, but uh, don't worry about it. Say what you want to say, and then I'll edit my my blip out. Yeah. Well, just like you said, that that disparity of you know not talking about it does create problems. And I tell my students, I tell my friends, you know, talk money first. Even if there's no money, make the agreement about what's expected before you do any work, and then you'll never be disappointed even if there's no money involved, then, then everybody knows you're on the same page, um, but especially do it if there is money involved, you know, get it done, get it at least written in an email. You don't always need contracts, but just something written down that you can reference later is so important. And it really helps advocate for everybody else who's charging and you know commanding rates um, because yeah, it's just about professionalism and people, people appreciate that. Awesome. Well, hey, Adam, thank you so much for, for taking just a little bit of time to talk about these things. Um, if you want to learn more about Adam, all of the relevant links will be down in the description below. Um, go check out what he's doing. Uh, and uh, thank you again for, for your time. Thanks, Spencer.